Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to weekly discussion with myself and Zainab Jalil. Assalamu Zainab and welcome back. Okay, well, in this segment, we're going to be talking about a story that I saw in Al Jazeera. And it's a story about how Israel um, security army abused Palestinian children and they use unnecessary force to arrest or detain Palestinian children as young as 11. According to Human Rights Watch, security force have choked children, thrown stone grenades um, without their sort of integrate, um, inter without their parents. Um, so, I mean, there has been a s report that was carried out by the UN right groups who found that um, Israel police and army were guilty of torture, abuse, and of children being in occupied um, West Bank in the in I think in 2013 and um, I think recently it was uh, two days ago um, um, Al Jazeera did an article on it um, do you want do you, what were your thoughts on it um, well it didn't come as a surprise to me mm -hmm. um, that uh, this particular arc article um, where, where, they're, where they're informing us that Israel the Israeli army is amongst the world's um, child right violators mm. um, uh, the way that they brutally without reason without uh, explanation um, uh, children have been attacked um, in cases be uh, killed um, and yet they are not on the on the watch list on the international watch list of countries that do this i know and it's surprising because it's one country that throughout up and down everyone unanimously has agreed that the way Palestinian kids are being treated is unfair unjust and that's in the most politest form of actually putting it because I mean this incident um, the story that I was actually looking at it was so heartbreaking that um, it's I don't know how to sort of like I don't understand how the whole it was only last week the President of Israel was showing his sympathy to Syria and talking about the violation and the talking about the kids and how the gas attack and all that stuff. But then it's happening in his own country and to think it's an ongoing case since ever since what well, back in it's been over six years or what or more? Um, it's it's continuous for a yeah. long time, but uh, this particular story talks about a young boy who was um, uh, brutally attacked uh, uh, in the middle of a street while he was just going shopping with his mum and his mm. auntie, and he got shot with a rubber-coated bullet in his right eye, and he's permanently blind in his I in his right eye now. Um, they did say he needed about 17 stitches, but yet. Um, Obviously, he still hasn't. He was lucky to survive. I know. He was one of 82 Palestinian children that were wounded by the Israeli forces just in 2016. Uh, th these are the one-off random attacks on children. Mm. Uh, 82 that had been wounded uh, using live ammunition. And this is according to the Defense for Children International Palestine, a children's right group. These are the facts and figures from the world's uh, human rights group watches. But um, it did also say um, 2016 was the deadliest year in a decade for Palestinian children in the occupied West Bank of East Jerusalem. The right group recorded the killing of 32 children throughout the year, either by Israeli forces or private security guard. Nine children were injured by the crowd control weapons, five by Israeli forces, which include sponge-tipped bullets and type of rubber. Two children were killed by these type of weapons during... So, I mean... It just become like people were dying and it just became figures. It just like... I actually found this particular story really upsetting to read because mm -hmm. it said that this young boy who had been attacked randomly, shot in the eye, came uh, in a, his near-death experience, survived now being half blind from one, mm -hmm. as in blind from one eye. His father uh, did report it to the uh, to the police and uh, tried to um, uh, put his uh, complaints forward. Uh, nothing was done about that, but instead, within days, his house got raided. Yeah. Two pairs of trousers got stolen, his and um, his brothers or fathers. And uh, then he was arre arrested himself, taken into the police, beaten and battered by the police to force a confession out of him, mm. showing him images of somebody wearing his trousers that were stolen from his house when and he was at home on. and wearing a mask to try and get force a confession out of him to say that that is him committing um, uh, some other crime. Yeah. Um, 
the brave child who had just been blinded from one eye was being beaten um, uh, at such a young age, he still was brave enough to take those beatings and not give in to the, yeah, uh, the, g uh, he the does confession. Yeah, say like, um, I said, uh, um, the Israeli office started screaming, who is this in the mask? And I said, I don't know. It's not me. He started beating me on my stomach, my back. He pushed the chair where I was sitting. I fell to the ground and he kicked me. It was brutal. He was very violent. To think, like, to that level of abuse just to force crime on innocent people. This is clear framing, somebody. Mm. Um, uh, now, uh, this particular oh, story... Oh, had four days in detention, so you could imagine what happened in four days. The amount of torture that the poor child went through, uh, like, luckily he didn't give in and he was still brave to take that and um, uh, the high co uh, the court ruled it out. Yeah. But imagine if he had fallen weak during the beatings and the torture and just to make the beatings stop, uh, if he had just confessed, what would ha then had happened to him? It just reminds me of Zainab al-Ghazali's story where she was brutally beaten in prison to, sh like, as she said, the law doesn't exist and the <sighs> fact that they put rats in her cage, they used to beat her. And a lot of people generally, I mean, when you hear about these incidents in the prison and you think it, it just sh it's I okay um, I think we've got a caller on the line let's line come caller hello Slanker alaykum assalam my name is Ayan Abdul Qadir I am living in the in England I have supporting it is that you're discussing about your supporting in the Palestine because you're right you said international law is and for human rights is the watchless. Sorry, sister. Um, um, what was your name again? My name is Ayan. I am calling in the England, but we have the problem in the issue in the Palestinians that suffered 70 years and the human rights and international law. They watchless. They killed innocent children and mothers and innocent people in the jail 24 hours. When you say what? they're killing, who are you referring to? We, this is the, your right, the international oh. laws in this the blindness, we need in the action, go to international laws in the military action in the Palestinian, attacking and supporting the Palestinian people, in the innocent people that died. You must, you must have family in Palestine. What? You have family in Palestine? No, I am supporting human rights in this day, mm -hmm. human rights is the Palestine, and okay. also I am... I am the looking for in this human rights all the world, Syria, Syria, and, and, and Syria and Palestine. Palestine has suffered 70 years. I am, mm. I have the international helping them people, Somali Women Association. Also, we like in the human rights in the world justice, equal human rights. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Well, thank you for your call. Is there a point that you would like to make? Would you like to add a um, few more to our discussion? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think um, she's put the phone on. Well, that was that was an interesting point. I think um, she's um, the sister was stressing and quite upset. Um, naturally, as we all are, uh, at how long uh, this has all been going on and, and I think how she it's was not just a one-off or a new yeah, issue. Yeah, and I think it wasn't only about Palestine. I think she also mentioned the fact that Syria as well, and she's overly concerned about what's happening around the world and the fact that the report that people are seeing from the UN, I think she also referred back to the UN reports as well. But um, like I was saying, I think during Al-Ghazali's time, the president was taken over. That's why they had a better life. But now in Palestine, the situation is so, it's just that the whole world is involved, but yet not, if that makes any sense. Palestine, uh, many people say, is the forgotten land, when it's actually the holy land, one of the most special places on this planet. But it's, uh, um, a lot of people do feel, a lot of Palestinians feel that it's, uh, they're forgotten by the international... What do you think people could do to help? Well, I mean, I know we personally, I know until the pli political climate doesn't change, their situation isn't going to change. But that's, a, that's an interesting point, that is the answer itself. Mm -hmm. Until the political situation doesn't change, it won't change itself. Everybody has to do their part to make it happen. This article by Al Jazeera itself, that's talking about what Israel is doing with the ch uh, being a child rights violator, uh, they mentioned that um, in 2015, the UN um, uh, 
children and armed conflict blacklist uh, so the, the the international watch list the blacklist of which countries are blacklisted in terms of being child right uh, child uh, rights violators Israel managed to lobby themselves out of being put on the list so they were brutally killing children and they managed to lobby um, uh, the US and the Congress to uh, uh, get themselves taken off the watch list. So in, to, uh, in 2016, when, when the numbers have gone up, mm. uh, there's, a, there's a new uh, Secretary General uh, of the UN and he is currently being lobbied uh, by human rights groups um, uh, to add Israel onto the uh, international watch list, onto the blacklist for human rights violators, for child rights violators. Is that violators. all in Al Jazeera? This is all in the, this particular um, uh, article by Al Jazeera. So uh, reading this, I thought, first it angered me, that first they commit the crimes, then they get themselves, um, uh, uh, allow themselves mm. not to be put onto the watch list. But then I'm like, wait a minute, the lobbying is so powerful, that's exactly what we should do on the other side. Yeah, but saying that, it's like there's this other article again it's around obviously not so much palestine but i don't remember if you remember the incidents of um nazia shah who is um who's tweeted or no she i think she put a statement of, about something on facebook yeah it was on facebook wasn't it and um she got done by the jewish lobby and wasn't it um but n and i think it was ken livingston that backed her at that point but now Recently, in the last couple of days, Naz Shah is back in for Ken Livingston's um, being suspended, which for me, it was kind of slap in the face because he, um, she sort of, she made a comment and then she apologized for being anti-Semitic on Facebook and that was back in 2016. And now um, she's also signed a letter with the Jewish Labour uh, movement to condemn ex-London um, mayor. And um, uh. go on. She uh, agreed with the mayor of London, uh, who were both calling for uh, Ken Livingston to be expelled, yeah. uh, because um, v when when uh, claims were made uh, or the interpretation of Ken Livingston to uh, to had made an anti-Semitic comment uh, in the past when he, uh, last year when he re when he referred um, to history when he said that Hitler was supporting Zionism, mm -hmm. that's what he said Hitler's agenda was. Uh, some have. Uh, taken this as an anti-Semitic comment. Other people have taken this as a fact. I'll, gi I'll give you a couple of quotes in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, for that particular comment, Ken Livingston was, um, exp um, he wasn't expelled, but he was suspended from the Labour Party for a year. Mm. So right now, Nas Shah, um, Sadiq Khan, and many others are calling for Ken Livingston to be expelled completely from the Labour Party. When what had actually happened is right now they've only uh, extended one more year for mm. him to remain suspended until maybe they think about what to do or, 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 it's quite sad, or wait for him to apologise to what they Ken believe Livingston is wrong. Ken Livingston actually backed um, MP Nas Shah and uh, when he, like a year ago over her comment and the fact that she apologised and she quickly changed side, it says a lot. And I know. Um, so they can't tweet it and then Nasha sort of agreed saying that we all make mistake leadership is about fro um, learning from him I was just thinking to myself I hope Bradford people don't think they made a mistake as well do you get it <laughs> so it's just um, the whole thing is quite sad I mean you were referring to quotes what are people thinking what are they saying um, there were a few comments on this particular article on the Jewish news itself mm. uh, which amused me no um, I'll tell you one uh, Loretta Hilmi said Naz has got a cheek condemning Ken Livingston. She's a Zionist traitor. There's no place in the Labour Party now. She's one to watch as a troublemaker. This is what people are saying. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Again, that was in the same article. In so the same article, in the comment section, in the same article. Mm -hmm. And here's another one by Jeannie Mehta. Fail to see how uttering historical fact is anti-Semitic. Do we have free speech in the UK? Or is it only that speech which is approved of by the Zionists whose right-wing government is ethically cleansing Palestinians from their own lands while we all go, la, la, la? So th th these are some of the comments made uh, on the there same article. There wasn't many comments on that article. There's about two or three, and they're the ones that you've just read out, aren't they? Yeah, there was a third one, actually, oh, by David Morling, which said, 
which bit of what Ken actually said was untrue. So uh, there is public support with Ken Livingston um, saying that he was just stating a historical fact. People, uh, a lot of people don't see how that could possibly be offensive or, uh, or anti-Semitic. It's come to a point that people who claim to say they're speaking the truth and the people who say they represented the actual the way things are, they get penalised. And it's come to a point that as long as you come across apologising or as long as you come across saying what certain um, strong lobby group wants you to say you seem like you're in a comfort zone and it feels like at times it's quite sad to think I mean most of people in Bradford the constituency that Naz Shah actually represents are probably more quite sympathetic towards what Ken Livingston has said so I'm not sure if that was her personal view or if that was the view of the constituency as a whole like because obviously she's their voice it was pretty obviously her personal view because her comments were on social media um, I mean, it's hard to. For, uh, her I mean, at the moment, of yeah, it's hard to tell. As an MP, I mean, she has a responsibility of representing the view of the constituency. So, I guess um, we should find out through her if that was her personal view or if that's how the constituency feels. Yeah, she needs to be questioned actually, and she needs to be questioned, lobbied, and held to account by her own constituency in Bradford, because when your representative MP makes these kind of statements, signs and major petitions um, affecting national issues, the constituents of that particular MP should go and lobby their MP and ask them a few questions. And because actually, that's the view that they also represent as well, because it's not fair. Because to think, it's. Ken Livingston backed her and then she turned her back on her. God forbid, say she does the same on her constituency. They elected her, they voted for her and they got her in to represent their view in the parliament. And if that's not their view, then really, I mean, I, I'd like to refer back to her, um, her quote of like, people should l learn from their mistakes or maybe um, we, sh we should like look it into our leadership again. That would all come down to whether people acknowledge what they say and do as a mistake, then they will learn from it. That's what she's trying to say about Ken Livingston, but a lot of people are questioning that about her, which Let's is, find do you consider this as a mistake? And if so, you should learn from it. Mm. I suppose, um, again, until we don't hear her, we should our question and then see what she has to say. But um, there's something else which isn't political and it's sort of, again, Another BBC article which sort of targets the Muslim community in a, obviously it's not a huge practice, but the article on the BBC said, the woman who sleeps with a stranger to save her marriage. I know um, when this came out, it did create a fuss amongst a small group of people, but um, it was BBC Asian Networks, obviously, because it was Asian issue, they picked it up. They were saying that there's a, Basically, there was this lady, her and her husband were, um, they got married um, 20 years later, he became, I think she was in her 20s, and then he became abusive, and in between that, um, he gave her a divorce, and he said to luck, so her dad told her, that's it, the marriage is over, and um, obviously she thinks he's gone better, and now she wants to go back to him, and the only way to do that is Obviously, it's not a Muslim practice, from my understanding. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but she said there's this thing called halala, and they have a number of services, sort of like um, on the internet, where people sort of charge you money. I think uh, in this case, about fifteen hundred, and they sort of get married to you for a night, and then after you're married for a night, you like sort of sleep together, and then eventually you have a divorce, and then you could get married to your husband. Now. What do you feel and what is your interpretation? I think it's really disgusting and pathetic and um, anyone that would even consider this uh, is just embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, just to state the facts because uh, this concept of halala in some cultures, um, it's, it's, it's n it's not uh, uh, according to Islam. Uh, the, the Sharia Council in the UK has uh, condemned it amongst uh, any scholar or any, any mufti would condemn it because mm. it's, this practice is not from Islam. It's taking, it's taking something, um, it, it's, it's just playing around with the rules and it's really pathetic because, um, and you know what, what does happen to uh, when, when people resort to uh, taking actions based on ignorance?
mm. then there will be a lot of other people waiting for them to cash in on them or to take advantage of them, especially if they're desperate or vulnerable. And uh, this particular uh, article points something very alarming out. There's actually agencies providing this disgusting service. I know. When I actually sort of read the article, when I realized there's agency women take money and they sleep with a woman, and obviously, according to them, they think it's halal, but isn't that prostitution in another way? Because, I mean, halal, uh, temporary marriage, I mean, I did look into it. It's forbidden in Islam, and especially amongst the Sunni law. It's forbidden that it's not a... You can, I mean, I know of incidents where people... I mean, I know I've heard of incidents where You've had divorce with your husband, you got married to somebody else, but you don't get married with the intention of having a divorce. You get married and you live a normal life. And if, God forbid, if something happens to that person or you end up in a divorce, then you can go back. But however, it's not the norm. But you can't get married to someone with the intention of having a divorce, then that is haram in itself. It's not even valid. Of course. I, it's, it's funny that uh, for p anyone that would consider such an act would think that's valid, but then they seem to have taken the talaq or the divorce times three in one go as being very valid. Um, the I would urge people mm. to any such situations arise with yourselves or with anybody that you know, seek correct counsel, seek correct advice from qualified muftis, the Sharia council, from your imams, from people who are qualified to tell you where you stand. I already know of people um, uh, where uh, such incidents have happened where the husband has uh, uh, divorced the wife and he, he said or gave the talaq three times which which is like okay because in Islam you are like you have nikah yeah. three times you're married to somebody three times it's like having three lifelines mm -hmm. um, and then uh, they, they divorced him uh, three times in one go you know what the amazing thing is unilaterally amongst every school of thought there is no difference of opinion in the Sharia in this particular matter. Um, if anybody is interested, look it up from your qualified muftis and imams. But th there's in the Sharia, there's no, there's, it's not even one of those grey areas where there's a difference it's of not, opinion. It's not. In, in the fact that you, there's no such thing as hilalas in Islam. In fact, when the husband divorces a wife three times, it only counts as one divorce. Islam is so simple and so easy. People have complicated it for themselves from uh, ignorance, from not being informed, from culture. Um, uh, uh, contradicting our deen itself. Um, when, when, when a husband divorces his wife, it only counts as one divorce. And uh, uh, the whole idat period, you have the three cycles of the woman to um, uh, uh, to um, uh, recon uh, make reconciliation with each other and just to make up and cancel the divorce. Okay, I take it back. That's mm. it, cancelled. Um, uh, uh, people seem to have forgotten all of that. Let's just say somebody got uh, somebody uh, a man had divorced his wife, and more than three months or three cycles had gone by. It'd been a year or two, or a few years. One lifeline was gone. Two lifelines were remaining. Mm. You may re-enter your second lifeline from doing a nikah without involving a third party, without involving an, um, 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 uh, 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 this dumb practice of uh, hilal or anything as such, um, uh, just to re-enter the second lifeline. Mm. Um, I'm not a qualified mufti, but th this is a concrete evidence I found out um, um, uh, um, uh, through some okay. casework. Um, we're coming towards the end of the show. Um, would you like to sum up all your arguments? I would say I would strongly urge anybody to think rationally, especially when you're vulnerable, you're down, don't make any haste decisions. There are plenty of vultures out there to take uh, advantage. Um, just seek advice from qualified um, uh, muftis, imams or the Sharia Council, um, where they will give you correct evidence or advice uh, and your options according to the Sharia and not according to some cultural uh, ignorant uh, views. Do you talk about cultural ignorant view? There was something else that um, I'll just obviously because we're at the end of the show but I just wanted to show how disgusting uh, um, certain Muslim people follow certain culture there was an incident in Pakistan uh, where a girl's uncle ran off with another woman and to punish the mamu what they did his eight-year-old niece they got her they the elderies in the community wanted her to get married to the girls, the, the one that the uncle ran off with, 20-year-old uncle, as so her 20-year-old brother as a punishment to her uncles. Now, 
I don't know how that makes sense, and I don't know how that's punishing the uncle. An eight-year-old is paying the price for something her uncle did. And now if he ran off with somebody else, surely he should be punished. But if not, they're punishing her. And her parents pleaded like, to actually go easy on her. But they said if they would have to pay 800000 So. Um this particular story talks about this particu uh, this uh, this child. Luckily, her parents are supporting her. To point, like give brief point because we're right there. Okay. Um, tribal councils make make decisions um, in these small small remote areas. But in two thousand and four, the uh, the ex president Musharraf passed a law in Pakistan that uh, this practice is illegal. You can't trade um, uh, 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 girls or your daughters to uh, settle disputes. It's illegal in Pakistan. And it's illegal maybe in many other countries mm. that have passed such laws. Um, it's just terrible that a lot of people still live in ignorance that would, do, uh, that that would even try to form such practices. Well, thank you so much for your input. And um, that's all we had time for tonight. Take care. Asalaamu Alaikum.